I used to get all these catalogues and I used to get a nickel and I used to circle certain things and give them out of my classroom. And the kids would say, what's this for, sir? I said, gift ideas for the end of the year. <laughs> <coughs> but I thought, you know, that sort of sums up the world we live in. And it's juxtaposition across of what, you know, buying a, bur a beehive, buying a goat, buying soap, and some of the things that people struggle with in the world, and we can help out so much there. So I encourage you to keep praying about that. And this one's a personal one. I saw this one, I thought, I've got to share it with you, because this is how I approach things. It says, but if you can't read, it says, if it looks like this present was wrapped by a blind Tyrannosaurus Rex, it was from me. <laughs> and I bought Sri a present the other day, and I got the paper, and I carefully measured it, and I cut it off, and, I went to, and it didn't meet. So I taped it where it was, did the tape around the other side. Then I thought, well, there's a gap here. She can see what the present is. This is while she's in the kitchen, like, you know, four metres away. So I've got some different coloured paper and I taped it over the end. It looks really cool now. It's very artistic. But uh, that reminds me of what it's like. Folks, when we come to this time, there are lots of things that are happening in our minds. And someone said it before, there's, you know, we constantly, we're, we're rushing from one thing to the other. We've got lots of stuff happening, we've got family coming, family going, we've got to try and fit holidays in. I don't know how people can finish school and go on a holiday a week before Christmas, then come back and do Christmas. That just blows my mind. When I was teaching, I just dropped exhausted at the end of the year. And so we have all these things, we're getting ready for church, we're getting ready for going away. So all these things happen and I was just thinking about what this meant in a scripture verse that we've talked a little bit about, we're going to read through in a moment, just helps us just to sort of get that mind about. And we're going to talk about anticipation today. Anticipation of the coming King. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Father, we stand at this point in history, Lord, several 2,000 years ago, you made a difference to our lives and a difference to the lives of humanity. Father, we pray that that won't be lost on us. Father, we pray that that will sink into our hearts. Lord, we've been in our way of being through, Lord, just looking at your word the last three or four weeks, just what it means, to, Lord, to look forward to Christmas and different aspects of Christmas. But Father, today we want to focus on your son, Jesus. Lord, the anticipation that comes with that. Lord, I just thank you for your word that speaks into our hearts. Lord, that speaks the truth that will set us free. Father, we expect to hear from you today, and I pray, Lord, you'll have, Lord, just give us the heart to hear that. Lord, take away all the distractions. Take away the thoughts of what's going to happen at lunchtime, what's happening tomorrow, or how we're going to pack the car. Father, just leave all that. Lord, we pray that you'll just put that in its place as we come to worship in your word today. And Lord, the words I speak, Father, I pray your words in your name. Amen. The passage I'm speaking about, of course, is um, is in Isaiah and um, in Isaiah six, uh, sorry, Isaiah nine verses six on. It says, "For this, for unto us a child is born, for us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end." And he will reign on David's throne and establish his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. When that passage of scripture was written, it was written 700 years ago, 700 years before Christ was born. And when I was reading through that and I was thinking, of Isaiah wrote these words, what were the people thinking when they read that? Because they had synagogue and they had temple. And the, the scriptures were read. And what were they thinking when they were thinking, well, this guy's talking about a king coming. And Richard shared some scripture verses this morning about you know, all the prophecy that's been said about Jesus. And you sort of think, well, what are we anticipating? Are we anticipating we've got enough ham left? Or well, the coleslaw will stretch? Are we anticipating that when, when we meet up with this relative we haven't seen for a while that things are going to go a bit haywire? Or we're we anticipating that, you know, there's other stuff we need to get our mind around. What is God saying to us in this situation today? I want to encourage you with some facts that I came across recently. And um, there's a guy around, his name's Mark McClindle. And Mark McClindle is a statistician, but he's a Christian guy as well. He's, he's not biased in any way. He says, it, he says facts as they are. So if you want to know how badly um, Christianity is faring in the secular world of Australia in this time of the year, have a read of his book. He's got a book out that I read a little while ago. It's called Australia XYZ. It talks about generation gaps. 
But um, this was recently posted on the 20th of December online by a, a, an, author, an author named Kayleen Payne. And it came up with these, these important facts, nativity stats. So Mark McKindle was the source. And he said that in his survey he did recently, 91% of people are happy to see the nativity scenes in shopping centres and public places. That says something about a world that's sort of mixed up, doesn't it? 91% of people are happy to have them there. And as, the, as, more, as you see the stats, more is revealed. 86% there who have no religious belief are supportive of it. So even the people who don't even believe in God say, oh yeah, it adds to things. I think that's pretty significant too. 53% says it's important and should not be lost. So we need to maintain that tradition if you want to use those words. And 38% should be, it should be allowed in public places. Now sometimes we hear contrary to that about Christianity. We hear contrary to that about the world waging war. And yet underlying all the things the media says is this fabric of people who said, no, we need something there. And we recognise this time of the year. And I wondered too when I was looking at these whether people have an expectation at, and I use the word Christmas time, that they might hear from God in a different way. And of course, you know, what is our role in that as a person, as an individual, and also as a church family? And I think there's one more there. 85% of people prefer Christmas, Merry Christmas, over Happy Holidays or any other sort of greeting. So I know on Facebook there's always this little war waging about Happy Holidays, which is an American thing, because they have Hanukkah, which is really close to Christmas. And of course, with the Jewish people, don't think that Jesus is the Messiah. So they try to encompass everything with just Happy Holidays. But uh, in Australia, we've always said Merry Christmas. And so when it starts to creep into our vernacular, into our language, we start to say, why are we doing this? It's bad enough we've got to put up with Halloween and all that stuff that's happening. So let's get back to our scripture. I just want to encourage you. you feel encouraged? Yes, Pastor Doug, you are encouraged. Some people are going, yeah, okay. This air conditioning's not low enough. I'm going to sleep here. So the ancient text, I just want to just touch on this. It's important we get this in our minds because this is part of the fabric of you know, who we are in, in history. Is that as I said these words 700 years ago. So 700 years from when he said them is when Jesus was born. So what happened in the life of the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, in that time before that happened? A lot of people believe that Jesus being sent by God was a response to the circumstance. But if you read through Isaiah particularly, it talks about Jesus coming as part of God's plan right from the get-go. It's not plan B. And so when we come into the nativity and this expectation that we're talking about, it's not something that just happens as a knee-jerk reaction. It's part of God's plan. And the, and the, and the anticipation comes from how we engage in that and what, how we think about it. So there's 30-plus Old Testament prophecies about Jesus, references to Jesus' birth in particular. And in that context, they use the words King, Emmanuel, Jesus, Messiah, Wonderful Prince of Peace, and a few other bits and pieces as well. And the Magi knew about it because they said, we've read about this in the prophecy, and we've been travelling for two years to come and see the infant Jesus. But there's been some expectation. Or people just so blasé. I mean, when you think about it, like, they went into exile after this prophecy. They lost their identity as a nation. They had their land taken away. They were shoved off to Babylon. And that was overthrown by the Assyrians and the Persians. And in the end, Persia said, all right, we'll send a few of you back. So a few of them wandered back. A few went up to Samaria. And so it all just unfolded like that through history. But in amongst all that, and then you've got the Persian rule, you've got the Greek rule, then you've got Roman rule, the people would have been feeling pretty ripped off. Where is God? He made a promise to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, that this was going to be, you know, our people are going to be a blessing. And in the light of the secular world they lived in, this all fell flat. And they, it just seemed to dissipate away. I wonder too, when I was looking at this, and I apologise for the colours, but when you're working with word um, shapes, you only get so much to deal with. I haven't got any gifted um, technology or, or programs. But I wonder if there was a high expectation when this was first read. When Isaiah first wrote it and was recorded, I wonder if people went, oh good, we don't have to put up with this for very longer, and so it's going to be really awesome. And then as that time waned away and we didn't hear from God and they didn't hear from God and things happened, then they went, mm, yeah, okay. And then by the time they got to the exile and they're in the 400 years between the testimonial period, they're going, blah, God don't matter. 
You know, and I look at our society and I think they're in the blah period. I think there's a lot of people, they look at Christmas time and they put it into that nice little bundle and but they don't understand that that's God's message for salvation for mankind and they just let it go and they say, well, God is not real. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But just about how that is. And then I thought about the other way. So I love playing around with these things. And I thought, well, some people believe it's never happening, that the Messiah has never come. You know, there's some people who still don't recognize Jesus as Messiah. Despite what all the scriptures say, they say Jesus was a nice guy and they don't equate baby Jesus with growing up Jesus. So they just say, well, that's how it happens. And they say, yeah, he's never, you know, there's no, there's no big deal there. Then there's sort of, some are hopeful. When you do a lot of funerals, there's a lot of hope in the room, whether they're believers or not. Sometimes if they're not believers, they have the, their hope is desperate that their loved one has gone to be in heaven. And, and they hope to meet them there someday. And then you get the Christians who say, no, we know where he's going and we're going to be there one day too. But there's that underlying hope in humanity. And of course, there's a small amount of us that are excited. In that anticipation, we're excited. I got a real buzz last night. I went to bed early and I tried to get to sleep and, and some of our family arrived and they came out and I tried to you know, be as quiet as, as to sleep as I could, but you know, they're all excited and bubbling around out in the house so I went out and I thought I'm going to check out what presents they bought me <laughs> you didn't see it kids but I walked out and I had one eye and you said oh good to see you <laughs> oh that's a good one <laughs> it was an anticipation even from me and I've got to confess that now please forgive me I was looking forward to the kids coming but not for their gifts well that was a bit of a sideline bonus but it's important too I suppose that in anticipation we don't miss the message because we look forward to this time of the year so much. So many things go in. Like people hang out to wear Christmas clothes. You don't see anyone in June wearing a Santa hat down the street. If they do, they're not the full quid. You know, even though it might be warm and things like that. And so we have this anticipation for this time of the year. And so people are waiting for God. And the Israelites were waiting for God and, and the world is waiting for God and just to see what he's going to do in this situation. And is he even going to show up? Is he even going to intervene in this life? We look at the re recent political developments. We say, where's God going to intervene in this? This is madness. What's happening now? We got a, I got a letter given to me last week about um, a politician who wrote and said, 30 years this has been in the making, what have Christians been doing about it? When is God going to intervene in the political situation? And so there's those sort of pressures that are put on us as well, as well as people who get sick of waiting. I love the, the, the to me, ma humanity is summed up in the Mount Sinai incident. Mount Sinai, Moses gets everybody there, and they're all wandering, all millions of them, whatever it is, and they get in there and they're, on the, they're running away and they're in, in the exodus, and God says, come up the mountain and talk to me. So Moses goes up to the mountain. So the people are left down the bottom. So what did they all do? Did they all fall into prayer and piously and even some, even some um, um, fast? No, they don't. They get sick of waiting. And when they get sick of waiting, what they do, they make up their own religion. And they go, oh, well, look, we used to, there used to be this Baal thing they used to talk about. And this Baal thing, let's make a cow. And let's worship a cow. Who ever thought of that idea up? But they weren't there. They were only there a short while in perspective, but they had to reinvent something. And so they couldn't wait for God. And I think our world today is putting stuff in place of God because they just don't know how to wait for him. They don't know how to recognize the signs. Their anticipation has got to such an extent that they can't wait any longer. And so they replace our God that we love and worship with another God, with, and we call it idolatry. They put something else up on the pedestal and say, this is us. Some people it's work. Some people it's family. Yeah, that's right. Some people worship family over God. They think family is more important than God. And that happens in churches. They put other things. They put up their career. They put up relationships. Where would we be today if the person we fell in love with, husbands and wives, if the, if the other one wasn't a believer? Would we say, well, God can wait because I really need to work on my relationship? Or do we join together in that situation? See, God's saying all this through humanity. And we've got to make sure we listen and respond to it the correct way. And 2 Corinthians, it calls it an indescribable gift. And, and when you think about it, it's just a short passage. It says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The gift that he gave mankind. 
the gift of eternal life, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of his son Jesus. And of course, we read in scripture that in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, when Jesus started his ministry, he was not what they were expecting. He is not what they were expecting. They were expecting someone to ride in and beat people up. They were expecting to ride in with his armies. He was going to be king. He was going to smite down the enemy. And he came in with love and grace. And went, yeah, that's not what we're looking for. We're under Roman rule here. Whack them. Knock them off. You know, do the right thing, man. History says in the Old Testament, we read about it, just wipe them, smite them from the earth. So it wasn't what we expected. And I wonder if this time of the year, when people contemplate what Jesus is about and then the nativity narrative, whether they, the whole message that comes of salvation out of that is not what they expect. Because they just want to leave it in that little catacomb. They want to leave that little quiet little spot and not be impacted by it. And not think this is more than just lunch and presents. It's about happen what happens to us throughout our life and the rest of the year. When Jesus was on one of his missionary exploits, he went up into Samaria and he was at a well and he met a woman. We know the story in John 4 about how this woman had a questionable background. She had several husbands, a guy she was with that wasn't a husband, and, and he asked her for a drink. And his response was, if you knew what the gift was, just read it out for you. He says, he answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If people who are looking at Jesus knew what that gift actually was in that little manger, they'd be asking more about it. If we don't become um, complacent and we think, oh, well, we've got to get through Christmas first, we actually make Christmas about Christ and about the salvation message, we don't miss out on the drink, the drink of the living water. See, when I see these things and I see passages of Scripture, and please forgive me, but I think of people who don't know Christ and what my role is in that. And you might say, well, that's a pastor, that's your job. But that's your job as well. If you are here today and you love Jesus, you've got to be thinking of people who don't know Christ and how you can make that connection with them so that they understand the importance of this baby and it won't be just left to January 1 when you throw out the Christmas tree, but actually goes through their life. And it sounds like I'm repeating myself over and over again sometimes. That's my heart. That's my heart for you guys. It doesn't just sit on empty words. It becomes a relationship that's alive. And it's not about baby Jesus. Anyone seen Talladega Nights? Go on, put your hand up if you've seen Talladega Nights. Okay, I know who to talk to later and pray with and over. It's not a, you know, some of the things in the movie. The, the prayer at, when they say grace is hilarious because it just sums up how people see, I think of baby Jesus laying there in the manger all sweet and innocent and all. And they go on all these different scenarios of baby Jesus. But the point is, when they're saying grace, they're saying baby Jesus. They don't make the connection to grown up Jesus and what that means for them. In James 1.17 says these words, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Every gift comes from above. The gift of his son Jesus is perfect and is from above. We're gonna, some the kids did an amazing job. But the gifts we give even here at this table, we pray over that stuff. We say, Lord, let this fall into the hands that need it so that they can make a connection, not just the gift, but the gift and where it comes from. Not because it comes from me back here in Australia, but it comes from God and a God that wants a relationship with them. When you give your tithes and offering in, you're not giving money to the church to make sure the pastor's got the latest car. Have you seen my Prado? It's not the latest. It's that you're giving money to the kingdom of God. So it points to him. That's why I call the offering worship in offering. It's worshiping God in that way. Then we've got these messages that come out in scripture and I'll just read through these quickly and I uh, don't want to take up too much of your time because I know you've got so much to do today getting ready for Christmas. There's a message of change that comes through from Scripture. The message of change in Matthew 5.17 says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. There's a change that happens with the birth of Jesus. And when he goes into his ministry, it's the change in our lives. Is there a change in your life? Is there something that's happened in you that you can't fight anymore? You think, oh, I need more of this. 
You see, the Jews all thought when Jesus came, he was going to maintain the law that they'd set up, the law that was almost impossible for man to meet. And Jesus said, no, I'm going to fulfill that law with love and grace and forgiveness of sin. You won't have to worry about how long you carry a needle in your pocket anymore, Eugene. Because on the Sabbath, you weren't supposed to walk more than 700 metres with a needle in your pocket. Or else you'd be considered going to work, and as a tailor, that would be against the law. I'm pleased you know about that, Eugene. You thought Australia was all mystery, didn't you? Now it's all cleared up for you. But he come to fulfil the law. And that means that he's put his love and grace and mercy on that. And that's the message is for us today, is about that, how it works. And one of meditation, Mary's words are beautiful. When the shepherds had came to see her and they heard all this stuff and she said, whoa, you know, this is all, you know, blah, I said this and this, said this, and the angel said this to me ages ago, nine months ago. And, the, and it says in scripture, she pondered it in her heart and cherished it. And the message is about that meditation in Christ. A real challenge to you. If you want a challenge, you find a way to meditate on Christ. Don't just do your Bible reading. Don't just take out the daily bread and read through it. But actually look at the scripture verse and just pray, Lord, what is this? And meditate on those words. You will find a fresh revelation. If you take the time to engage in God, Spirit will speak. And you'll have a fresh revelation. You'll see it differently. What the person wrote in the daily bread necessarily won't be what God gives you. But it's there. And when we meditate on God, we allow him to speak to our heart on so many levels. And we become engaged with the guy who came as a baby and died on the cross. It's also a message of favour in Luke 2.14. A lot of people misread this one. I know the world does and certainly Christmas cards do. But in Luke 2.14 it says, Glory to God on the highest and on earth peace to all men. In my Bible, it says, on, and peace to those whom his favour rests. So when your favour rests in God, that means you found a place with God. You found a relationship with God. And so when glory to God in the highest, his son Jesus is there to, for men can find favour with God. And when we find favour with God, something pretty special happens. And, um, and when that happens, then we can live in grace. And when we live in grace, we understand what it means to let people, you know, give you a hard time. You don't have to get back and get revenge. When you live in grace, you say, God, thank you for just putting up with me because I'm a sinner and I'm a shocker and I know you love me. That's what living in grace is. I know I need to repent, Lord. and I know that you'll receive my prayer of repentance because I need to come into your holiness again, to your presence again. How are we going? You hanging in there? One slide to go. You can go and get ready for Christmas Day. I'm about to go Boo! like that, but thank you very much, everybody. Last slide. So, worship team, if you want to come out and um, and uh, get yourself sorted out here and get yourself ready, and I'll get out of the road. And I don't want to hold things up. So our response to this time of year, and I want to encourage you to keep seeking this out is those three things up on the screen. The first one is that take it personally because God did. He took it personally when he sent Jesus to die for our sins. He sent his son as a baby to live as a man, to die of our sin, to be crucified and then risen again so that we have access to eternal life and a relationship with God. That was God took it personally. He sent his son. If you're a parent or even a pet owner, you know what it likes to be in charge and responsible for something that's fragile. And that's what he did. So he took it personally. I want to encourage you to take it personally. Be grateful and show anticipation. Oh, sorry, show appreciation about what it is. I've got a, a, little, a little video clip just to want to play, get Rob to play it for me. And it's just about just being grateful for things. It's done by a church in America, a little church, and I think they did a pretty good job trying to sum it all up.
whatever we want. <laughs> We've got clean water. Oh, that's great. Look at that. Ooh. I bet I know what this does. Rain down the glorious water. Ah, shoes. Oh, what do we got here, guys? Food. Mm, I love food. What? Um, a beef beef? Do you not have what? This is awesome. Come on, what's in here? Beef? The what? Dad, be careful. Oh, I have a car. Did you guys see this? Yeah, you have a car. Oh, a car. <laughs> and don't forget your coffee. You're the best. <laughs> and I just encourage you to be grateful for the gift of God's Son. The last one is to and t take time to seek how it applies to your life. Take time to seek how it applies. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your gift of Jesus. Father, we thank you there was anticipation about what he might be, an expectation of what he was and was not. But Father, we thank you for speaking the truth into our lives. That Father, that we know that you sent Jesus to die for us, that we may have eternal life and Lord live with you, but Lord also that we may share your word. Father, I pray that you might just watch over us this next few days. Lord, as we do wake excitedly tomorrow, Father, as we participate in family life, never be far from us. Lord, let, never let yourself be far from us, that Lord, we can be appreciative for that gift of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for each person in this room. Lord, I pray that you might just touch their lives in a significant way. In your name, amen. Thanks, Doug. I think just before we close, I'll just remind folks that if you're coming to worship tomorrow, Christmas Day, 9.30, you'll have missed all the fun and games. So we're worshipping together at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. So. And the Hawaiian shirts are encouraged. Hawaiian shirts are encouraged. So let's stand together and we'll close our service singing the first Noel. Got a big finish on it, so all those who want to run around with parts and what have you are most welcome to do so. Let's stand together. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. In fields as they lay, giving the sheep on the Winter's night that was so deep. No hell, no hell, no hell, no hell. God is the King of Israel. They looked up and saw a star shining in.
Heavenly Father, as we go out into the week and maybe meeting again tomorrow, we pray, Lord, that in the word Christmas, the bit that we remember most is the word Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.